first introduce Liam Min. Uh, Liam is currently a PhD student at UC Berkeley, and he was a member of Sample two years ago. I don't know, two more or three years ago here, where he worked on the TVM and other TVM project. And Liam is advised by Ian Stoic and Joseph Gonzalez. His research uh, lies in the inter intersection of machine learning and programming systems, especially DSLs. Um, for accelerated and scalable deep learning. And let's welcome Liam and take it away. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Liam Zhong from UC Berkeley. In this talk, I'm going to talk about ELPA, automating inter and intra operator parallelism for distributed deep learning. So, ELPA is a system we build to automate model parallel training of large neural networks. And I collaborate closely with Zhuo Hai and Hao on this project. Um, to make the talk interactively, please feel free to, to make the talk interactive. Please feel free to interrupt me anytime. Um, to begin with, let me introduce some background on large models and the distributed uh, training. So several of the recent advances in deep learning has been a direct result of significant increase in model size. For example, scaling language models such as GPT-3 to hundreds of billions of parameters and change them on much larger data sets enabled fundamentally new capabilities. So it's no surprise that the number of parameters in state-of-the-art models have grown at an exponential rate. So as shown in this figure, in recent four years, the number of parameters in state-of-the-art models are around 5,000 times larger. However, training these large models is very challenging because a model can have more than 100 billions of parameters. So you cannot fit the model into a single accelerator due to the memory constraint. In addition, it would take several hundreds of years to train such a model on a single accelerator. Therefore, distributed training is the only way you can train them. Um, distributed training is not an easy task today people have to build specialized systems just for training certain models. Um, there are several popular techniques such as data parallelism, tensor partitioning, and pipeline parallelism. Um, there are different trade-offs among these methods. Uh, basically to train a large model, you have to find a way to combine these techniques and then, train, and then you can achieve a good training throughput. Um, here are two examples of expert designed strategies. So the one on the left-hand side is a Megatron LM strategy for parallelizing the self-attention model in a transformer layer. Uh, because, because, uh, for a large-scale transform model, because the weight uh, is so large, so you cannot change it with uh, data parallelism because you cannot fit a model into a single GPU. So you have to partition the weight. And in this strategy, the first uh, weight matrix is uh, the first weight matrix has to be column partitioned, and the second weight matrix has to be row partitioned to minimize the communication cost. And the one on the right hand side is the G shard strategy for sparse mixture of expert transformer models. Um, the expert layer, this red box boxes, has to be partitioned along the expert dimension, while the non expert layers have have to be partitioned along the batch dimension for data parallelism. So to apply these parallelization strategies, model developers have to rewrite their model definition and uh, to specify the partition strategy and insert uh, necessary communication primitives such as the auto or here. So this makes developing new model or heterogeneous model very challenging. Uh, in this project, our goal is to unify all these parallelization strategies and build a compiler to automatically generate the optimal combination of them. So first, we summarize uh, the existing parallelization techniques into two types. So for example, this is a computational graph. How can we run it on multiple devices? The first type is intraoperator parallelism. So for each node in the graph, we can assign different regions of it to different devices. For example, if we have two devices, 
they can execute the first uh, matrix multi multiplication together and then execute the second matrix multiplication together and then execute the addition together. So in this case, we exploit the inherent parallelism inside a single operator. So we call it intra-operator parallelism. And the second type is inter-operator parallelism. For the same graph, we can assign the first half of it to device one and assign the second half of it to device two. In this case, we exploit a higher level parallelism in the whole graph. However, due to the data dependency, device two has to wait for the device one to get its input data. So some devices might be idle at some time. To fix this issue, typically pipelining is, is used, like we can send multiple micro batches into the pipeline and achieve parallelism. Um, we can classify, uh, with, with these two definitions, then we can classify the conventional parallelization techniques all into these two categories. So the figures below show some popular parallelization techniques for training a two-layer MLP. Uh, for example, data parallelism belongs to intra-operator parallelism because in data parallelism, the uh, data and activation are partitioned while the weights are replicated. And each device executes a, a, a tile of the matrix multiplication. And uh, the Megatron LM multiple partitioning strategy also belongs to this category. And other variants of data parallelism such as serial optimizer also belongs to this category. And for inter-operator parallelism, device placement and pipeline parallelism are two notable techniques. Um, the device placement plays different operators to different devices. It, it, it relies on the concurrent branches in the original graph to achieve good parallelism. So on the other, so if the original graph doesn't have too many concurrent branches, uh, some devices might be idle due to data dependency. And the pipeline parallelism solves this problem by splitting the input data into several micro batteries. So this effectively creates many concurrent branches in the graph and expose more parallelism opportunities. Uh, there are trade-offs between these two categories. Intra-operator parallelism typically requires a lot of collective communication such as or reduce and all to all. So uh, high bandwidth connection among devices are desired. On the, on the other hand, inter-operator parallelism uh, only use point-to-point -point communication. So it only commun communicates between the boundary of subgraphs, so which requires less communication. Uh, however, careful scheduling and partitioning is required to reduce the device idle time. Um, as you can see, there are so many parallelization techniques and training a large model efficiently often requires a combination of them. Then relying on manually designed strategy requires a lot of engineering effort. So researchers tend to search based auto parallelization. Uh, there are several prior auto parallelization systems. However, they all have a lot of limitations and cannot efficiently train state of the art large models. Uh, first, their search space are limited uh, because none of them supports all the parallelization techniques I mentioned above. And secondly, their search algorithm uh, cannot scale to large models. Uh, they either rely on random search or strong assumption of the model. As a result, none of the state-of-the-art models can be trained with these auto-parallelization systems. Uh, for example, Flex and flow, uh, flex flow and tofu, they don't consider pipeline parallelism or partial replicated tensors. And pipe dream and DAPO, they don't consider uh, operator parallelism or like matmo partitioning. Um, unlike exi existing systems, uh, we build alpha by taking a different view of parallelization techniques as summarized above we classify existing parallelization techniques into inter-operator parallelism and intra-operator parallelism. And then we find we can organize uh, these two parallelism as a two-level hierarchical space. 
this hierarchical space naturally maps to the hierarchical stru structure of common GPU clusters today, where we have fast interconnect between GPUs inside a node such as NVLink and the relatively slower interconnect between different nodes such as Ethernet. So to this end, uh, we construct a two-level hierarchical search space and then we design algorithms to solve, uh, to derive the optimal plans at each level. Okay, so next uh, I will explain our approach in details. So we can start with the overall architecture of LPA. Because we want to do auto parallelization, which means uh, the users don't need to change their model definition code. So our system will convert a single device code into a multiple device code. So the device, uh, so our system follows a compiler architecture. We can start with the runtime part. Uh, as I mentioned uh, before, in today's GPU cluster, GPUs are typically organized as a two-layer topology, so where we have fast connection inside the node and the relatively slower connection between nodes. So we use a 2D device mesh to denote this topology. Uh, inside this device mesh, uh, for example, here we have two workers and in, on, on each worker we have four uh, devices four or four accelerators. And uh, we can assume the communication inside one worker is faster and the communication between workers are slower. Uh, inside, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, so you mean it? the communication inside each node is through the, say, a CCR or something like that, and communication between nodes are, you need to go through the PCI is as slower, and you use the, that for inter-OP inter uh, parallelism, is that right? Uh, yeah, like that's our intuition. So that's, uh, that's our intuition to organize interoperator paradigm as the higher level and interoperator paradigm as lower level. So this is only like the intuition for our architecture design. But in, when we actually solve the problem, uh, we will generate a plan and uh, uh, like, we, like the plan doesn't uh, follow this, uh, doesn't follow uh, this principle strictly, it will find the optimal plan based on the profiling results. So, th so this is only like an intuition for our architecture. Okay, good. Yeah, and all the, all the device mesh here, they are logical mesh. So we will find uh, a mapping between this logical mesh to physical mesh. Okay. Well, then can you speak a little bit more to the intuition regarding um, the hierarchy? Yeah, so, so basically there are two kinds of parallelisms. Um, and uh, like our question is, uh, which one is the higher level and which one is the lower level? So we have to organize them as a two level hierarchy. And uh, we find interoperator parallelism, they require less communication. So we organize them as a higher, higher organize them to the high, higher level hierarchy. And for intraoperator or parallelism, because they require more communication. So we organize them as a lower level or inner level hierarchy. Because I in GPU, the, yeah. I was gonna ask if the, the diagram might be a bit misleading because it's showing the GPUs in this case are all seemingly connected to each other via NVLink, which I assume is like pretty high bandwidth. But I, I think like if we were to, expand this diagram out, what we would see is like clusters of GPUs that are connected with high bandwidth. And those clusters are connected via low bandwidth at the, you know, PCIe NIC level via this, you know, CPU connection. Um, that's, is that, is that a good intuition for like where the, you know, the 400 gigabytes per second is, is the GPU cluster itself the 10 to 50 gigabytes per second is the clusters being connected over the network. Is that right? Yeah, this is right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like when we actually generate the, 
So like um like uh this this intuition guides our design, but like our fi final generated plan um doesn't uh, follow this uh, mapping uh, strictly. So because inside a device device mesh, like we assume we, we can have a relatively fast interconnect. So we do uh, communication heavy intraoperator parallelism. And then in order to do interoperator parallelism, we stitch multiple device meshes together and form a pipeline among them. So they only need to communicate between uh, this, these edges, which requires less communication. And uh, for the compiler part, so this is how our runtime architecture supports these two kinds of parallelism. And for the compiler side, our input is a computational graph and a device cluster specification. We first run an inter-OP pass to slice the computational graph into multiple stages. And for each stage, we also assign a device mesh to the stage. So the de one device mesh is responsible for running the computation of one stage. And then for each stage, we run an intra-OP pass to uh, partition all the operator in the in this stage evenly across all GPUs on the device mesh. So this pass uh, generates the intraoperator parallelism plan for this stage, and we do this for all stage uh, step in the, one by one. And uh, then um, we generate the pipeline instructions to schedule these stages and all the instructions are statically compiled into a mesh executable. The mesh executable is sent to the corresponding device meshes, and then uh, we execute the device me de mesh executable on all devices and run the computation. So in this figure, the most important components are these two passes, uh, the inter-OP pass, which can uh, give a locally optimal solution for inter-OP parallelism. This is solved by a dynamic programming. And uh, the intra-OP pass, which can give a locally optimal solution for intra-operator parallelism. So this is solved by an integer linear programming. Uh, so then I, I will talk about these two passes uh, one by one. We will start from the lower level intra-OP pass so for, okay, uh, any question? Uh, so if I'm understanding this correctly, is stage one to stage n, is that a partition of the computational graph? Yes, yeah, stage one, two, three, they are partition of the computational graph. I see. And then for the device clusters, what, if you change the device cluster between runs, does that require recompiling your entire model? Uh, we, we want to change the, yeah, yeah, if we change the device cluster, we need to redo the optimization and re redo the compilation. Okay, so the, so the device cluster also um, kind of plays a role in deciding how the stages are partitioned. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, like basically we will generate a specific plan for one model on one device cluster. Yeah, if you change the device cluster, the, the, the parallelization strategy should definitely be adapted as well. I see. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we, we'll start from, start uh, with this intra OP pass. Um, for intra operator parallelism, we use SPMD style uh, intra operator parallelism. So basically, this means we will partition each operator evenly across all GPUs in a device mesh. Um, this this, this uh, style simplifies a lot of things, but it still can cover a lot of conventional techniques such as data parallelism, operator parallelism, zero optimizer and zero combinations. So um, it's, it's, it's powerful enough and uh, the goal is to find a partition strategy for each operator. So for example, this is the forward computational graph for 
multi for two layer MLP, and for the for the weight tensor, uh, it can be like row partitioned or column partitioned, or fully replicated or partially replicated. So uh, each node, so the the weight tensor has a partition strategy set, which contains several possible partition strategies. And similarly for the matrix multiplication, uh, there are also several parallel algorithms that can run the matrix multiplication. And different algorithms, they require, they have different requirements of the input layout. So for example, one algorithm may require uh, the weight to be column partitioned. Another algorithm may require the weight to be row partitioned. So um, the matrix multiplication also has a partition strategy set and each set uh, it requires different layouts of its input and generates output with different layouts. If the input doesn't meet the layout requirements, then we need to do like a layout conversion on the edge, which incurs a communication cost. So in summary, to run the computational graph, uh, the total time cost is node cost, uh, which is mainly compute cost plus edge cost, which is mainly communication cost. And our uh, goal is just to pick one partition strategy for each operator and minimize the total time cost. So we, we can um, take a closer look at this example and let me show some, show more examples of the possible partition strategies for each node and the cost on the edges. Um, so the input and the weight matrices, they can be either like replicated or row partitioned or column partitioned or like partial replicated. And the matrix multiplication, uh, it's a three level four loop. Oh, so we can parallelize the first loop or the second loop or some combination of these loops. Uh, so we, which leads to several different strategies. So for example, strategy one requires A to be column partitioned and B to be row partitioned and generate a fully replicated output. But it also requires an or reduce to accumulate the partial results. And the strategy two, um, it requires B to be fully replicated, but it doesn't require any communication to compute the C. So, uh, and there are like in total, there may be uh, dozens of possible algorithms to run a like batch the math model. And if Sorry, the layout. Not, can I ask a question? Is this um, like in the case of strategy three, my understanding here is that we, um, we replicate A on both devices. We split B. So the left half is on one device and the right half is on another device. We do the partial multiplications on A and B, but then isn't there a communication cost to actually merge those? Is that not counted here or am I, am I wrong about that? Um, it's not counted because the results are also uh, stored uh, like distributedly on two devices. Uh, oh, I see. So you're being explicit about the fact that, okay, the results are sitting on those two devices. So yeah, yeah. maybe that's useful later in the pipeline or something like that. Yeah, that yeah. Might actually, I yeah. see. Makes sense. Yeah. Sometimes the layout can be propagated. Sometimes if yeah. the layout cannot be propagated, then we need to we need to, to use communication to gather the results. Yes. Okay. That yeah. makes a ton of sense. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. So if the layout uh doesn't uh if the layout doesn't match, we have to use uh collective communication primitives to convert the layout. So for example, uh uh if the tensor is row partition or column partition, we have to use an all gather to gather them and get a fully replicated tensor. And to convert between row partition the tensor or column partition the tensor, we can use all to all to do the transpose. And to convert a fully replicated tensor to a column partition the tensor, we can we don't need we don't need communication. We can just do a local slicing. Okay, so uh, this problem, this optimization problem can be formalized as an integer linear programming uh, because, uh, because uh, like the depend for this graph, the dependency only happens between two nodes. So which, which results like a quadratic term in our optimization objective, and then we can linearize it and get a 
integer linear programming problem. So to build this problem, we enumerate all possible partition strategies for all operators, and we compute the communication cost on all edges for all strategy pairs. So, uh, and then we, we can uh, minimize this objective with an uh, integer open integer linear programming solver. So compared to prior work, uh, for example, compared to TOFU, our formulation supports general graph instead of linearized graph. And the, like, so we can also support our 2D device mesh topology. And compared to flex flow, uh, our formulation has optimality guarantee. And we support more, we support additional partition strategies in our search space when we enumerate the partition strategies. Okay, so this is all for the intra-OP pass. And then uh, we can take a look at the inter-OP pass. I have one uh, question about the previous slide. Okay. So I suppose in some cases, they, uh, I mean, the communication and the communication can be overlapped, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, in our formulation, we, we don't consider this. Yeah. But that, that, Okay, so it's still a good cost model. Yeah, um, there may be some room for improvement, um, but if we consider like the overlapping between computation and the communication, mm -hmm. like we cannot easily model this as an integer linear programming because like yeah, the yeah, dependency, yeah. there are a lot of complicated dependency. And uh, like in, uh, like in in practice we can first solve this optimization problem and get like a good enough solution. And then we, uh, we do the overlapping optimization. This can also give us like very good uh, solution. So like basically we separate them, but don't, and we, we don't consider all of them into a single optimization problem. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, next, we'll look at the inter OP pass. Uh, so here we mainly target ta target pipeline parallelism because it's the most efficient techniques for training large models. And the goal for inter OP pass is to slice the computational graph uh, into multiple subgraphs. So for example, here we, we get four four subgraphs, and we also slice the input cluster into four sub meshes and uh, we pair one stage with one mesh. So this mesh is responsible for executing this subgraph. And then we form a pipeline between these four meshes to achieve uh, inter-OP parallelism. And um, because the, the objective here is the pipeline latency uh, we want to minimize uh, the pipeline latency here. So the pipeline latency consists of two terms. The first is the warm up phase, and the second is the stable phase. Uh, the stable phase is bounded by the slowest pipeline stage. So this is uh, our objective. And uh, uh, for each term, for example, the TI, it's the uh, optimal cost for executing stage I on its assigned sub mesh. So this TI can be uh, can be got by running our intra OP pass. So like running our lower level pass. And um, we uh, we minimize this pipeline latency uh, by running a dynamic programming algorithm and the, pro the dynamic programming algorithm will output the uh, graph partitioning and the device mesh partitioning strategy and also like the number of pipeline stages. Um, there are some technical details here. Um, so for this TI, we will run the intra OP pass and the profiling to get a table. So this will be the input of our dynamic programming. And we also um, have some, we also make some assumptions uh, 
of our search space to simplify the problem. So for example, we have to assume the forward path and the backward path of the same stage are assigned to the same sub -mesh. So given this assumption, uh, we can we only uh, optimize for the forward path of the graph and then we assume the backward path is symmetric. And in order, and because we also uh, slice the bigger cluster into several sub meshes, we have to guarantee the sliced sub meshes can fully cover the original mesh. So here we carefully pick some sub mesh shape, shapes and with these sub mesh shapes, we can guarantee uh, our strategy, our cluster slicing strategy are always valid and they can fully cover the original device mesh. Okay, and um, to solve this, uh, to, to minimize this objective, we can enumerate uh, this max term and convert this to a, a conventional dynamic programming program. And the, but the complexity is still very high uh, because it has a term which is k to the power of five. So this dynamic programming cannot scale to large graphs. And to fix this issue, we reduce k by running a pre-processing. So we run a graph clustering algorithm to cluster uh, similar graphs into like a big uh, layer. So we can reduce the number of operators in the graph. Okay, so this concludes the core techniques we used to, to build ELPA. Do you, sorry, the, this is a high level question. Which order do you run these in? And do you do multiple iterations for both? Do you do like, or because they're, because each is locally optimal, do you only have to do each stage once? Um, so yeah, let me go back to the figure. It's a very good question. Um, the inter OP pass, it will call the intra OP pass to get the providing results. Um, we only run, so we will run the inter OP pass only once, but I run the intra OP pass for all the uh, possible uh, stage mesh pairs. So like this pass will be only run once, but this pass will be run like for thousand times. I see. Okay. Okay. Like you can, right. you can see this as a search tree. Like this is the first level search tree and this is a second level search tree. So there are many nodes on the second yeah. level. Yeah. Okay. And um, in terms of implementation, we use JAX as our front end because uh, JAX has some nice features which makes building the compiler easier. So, so for example, we can trace a static computational graph that includes a forward pass, backward pass, and optimizer updates. So we can get the whole graph and it's easier. And, and this is necessary for us to do the optimization. And we provide, uh, we provide a one-line auto-parallelization API as shown in this example. Uh, this is a typical training loop in JAX. Uh, you can, so for here, you can first, you create the model and you load a uh, batch from the data loader and you do one step gradient descent. Uh, to use our library, in this string step, you create the, uh, you, you compute the gradient and do the gradient update. So this is like almost all JAX program for training neural network follows this uh, structure. To use our library, uh, you only need to put add parallelize decorator on top of this chain step function. And during the first time you code this function, it triggers compilation. And then your computation will be run on a distributed cluster. This is very similar to the original jax.jit decorator. So the original jax.jit decorator, it compiles a training function for a single GPU and TPU or TPU where well, our at parallelized decorator it compiles a training function for a cluster of GPUs. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Zihao. 
Okay. Mm, one question. Uh, is there a case that we cannot split all piece? So there is another axis that we can split and make the computations independent. Uh, we can always split. For example, if if it's a reduction and we split it, and then in order to make the correct results, we will insert like and or reduce to gather results. So we can always make sure our results are correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like so. So do you mean like some operator operators like reduce? So we will. I, I, mean, I mean like batch norm. Oh, batch batch norm. So if you, uh, in in batch batch norm will be converted to like mean or like sum. So which is which are redu reduced, right? Yeah. Because oh, we, we, uh, yeah. It's composed to smaller OPs and. Yeah. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, oh, sorry, answer to your question. Um, out of curiosity, do you, I don't know much about JAX. Um, does JAX give you, do you have to trace to get a static graph that you then do your uh, analysis over or does it give you a static graph right away? Uh, it, it's it's implemented by tracing. So it executes okay. uh, this Python function and uh, trace the computational graph. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Are we assuming that the cluster of GPUs, um, are we assuming that each cluster has the same number of GPUs? Um, so you can see this. This is our input input cluster. We also, like it's a 2D cluster where we have N nodes and each node has M GPUs. And we assume like the communication among the rows are faster and the communication among the columns uh, sorry, the, the communication inside the row is faster and across the row is slower. And then our algorithm will uh, carefully slice the big 2D cluster into several sub meshes. I see. And we have, to assume, we have to assume all the GPUs in the cluster have the same compute capacity. Uh, is that specified? You know, it, in the, I, I love the user interface that you show on the next slide. Is that specified somewhere also in the Python, like in the call to parallelize in the parallelized decorator? Where, where do you specify? How does a user specify that um, schema or, or or arrangement of GPUs? Okay, so currently we build our like we we use Ray to for the cluster management, so they can give us like a Ray cluster, and then we will utilize all GPUs. Will detect all GPUs in that Ray cluster and use all GPUs in that Ray cluster. Ah, okay. So you just this is all done. The detection is done automatically in Parallelize. Or when, um, it, when it's no, no. You you still have to like import Ray and like call Ray then initialize, and then ah, uh, we okay. will detect okay. that Ray. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I can also give some implementation details because you are, I think you are expert of ML compilers. So in terms of implementation details, um, the first inter-OP pass is implemented on JAX intermediate representation, which is called the JAX PR. Um, we, we implement it at this level because we here we still need some machine learning semantics like forward, backward, and gradient. And then we'll convert the JAX-PR into XLS HLO. And then we, uh, at this level, we don't distinguish forward and backward. We run like our ILP algorithm on a general computational graph. And then uh, we use XLA compiler to uh, lower our strategy into executable code. And for pipeline execution, because it's currently not supported in XLA, so we design our own pipeline instructions. And in terms of the runtime architecture, um, for each worker, we use XLA runtime plus Ray for the distributed uh, execution. And for the communication, we build a communication library with Nico. Is there a question for, um, for Jack's PR? How you said that Jack's PR 
uh, also captured like forward and backwards mm -hmm. motion. How do they do that? Yeah, my my understanding of Jack's PR was more like a um, SFA type IR. Yeah, it's it's similar to uh, it's similar to relay, uh, and uh, that but but we know the corresponding between the forward and the backward. So we, we need this information for the pipeline parallelism. Is the forward and backward kind of passive explicit in Jack's Jack's IR? Uh, we we insert annotations in the Jack PR, so then we we can know the their correspondence. I see. Yeah, because the auto auto grid, uh, the auto differential algorithm, is implemented in Jack PR, and like we insert our custom annotation and hack the auto differential algorithm. I see. And how I'm not I'm not too familiar with Ray. How does the Ray actor interact with like the XLA runtime? Um. Okay. So here, like, we don't use uh many features from Ray. We just use Ray to launch the processors. On the distributed cluster and use Ray to detect all GPUs, all available GPUs on the cluster. So you can just see it, it as like a process launcher. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So the HRO is like the graph level IR, and you use the JXPR as a ten. No, no, it's not a tensor level. I suppose. Yeah, all, all of them are graph level, and in this project, yeah. we don't do tensor level optimization. So, for example, we don't do like uh, auto TVM or answer level optimization. We just use Kublas or QDN. Uh, I think uh, I have quest one question that whether the passes you apply will be contradict to Say kernel fusion passes. Um. Yeah, yeah. This is a very good question. Um. We because we like actually our algorithm work on very high level graphs, so um, and uh, the fusion passes will be applied after all of our passes. So for example, after we partition a matrix multiplication, it's still a matrix multiplication. And it's it can still be fused with like ReLU or other uh, element wise operators. And and if we partition element wise operators, after partition, it's still a valid HL organization. And the fusion pass in HL, it, it can still fuse them. So the order will be we first uh, uh, because the parallelization strategy is a high level thing. So we first uh, uh, we first uh, find the high level. Parallelization strategy, and then do the low-level operator fusion. Okay, so uh, another question is about the IRP stuff. Uh, if your tensor has multiple dimensions, I suppose the number of choices of layout would grow exponentially to the number of dimensions. Is that right? Yes, th that's correct. Uh, the complexity is like uh, grows. Uh, exponentially with uh, like number of dimensions, uh, but in the paper we also have uh, like other techniques to simplify the simplify the graph. So for example, if we have an element wise op operator, we will uh, let it to follow the layout of its uh, its previous its input, so we can greatly reduce the number of nodes in the graph. Oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Okay, then um, do you have any other questions? Okay, then I think we can uh, show some experimental results. Uh, we evaluate ELPA on an AWS cluster with eight, eight uh, P3.16 nodes. Each node has eight B100 GPUs, so in total there are eight by eight equals 64 GPUs. And we evaluate ELPA by training large scale models with uh, billions of parameters, including GPT-3 like transformer models, g -shard MOE language models, and wide ResNet. Our setting is weak scaling on model size. So which means uh, with more number, 
the larger the number of GPUs, the bigger the model will train. So with more GPUs, we train larger models, but we fix the batch size. So this evaluates uh, our, uh, th this evaluates the system for training large models. Sorry, uh, uh, can you explain that one more time? What does weak scaling on model sizes mean? You mean you're, you're, you are adjusting the number of parameters based on the number of available GPUs? Yeah, exactly. So here, okay. for example, in this, if we only have one GPU, we train a model with 1 billion parameters. And with 64 GPUs, we train a model with 64 billion of parameters. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so like, uh, and, but we fix the batch size. So the input data is, is the same. So this is like slightly different from how people evaluate the data parallel training. Because here we mainly evaluate model parallel training. So we, we want to train larger models. And uh, for GPT-3, it's like, uh, it's heavily optimized by manual systems. Uh, the Megatron LM is a specialized system for training GPT-3, and it also combines, it manually combines data, uh, it manually combines the intra-operator parallelism and the inter-operator parallelism, um, while LPA can automatically find uh, all the uh, manually designed strategies in Megatron LM, and the performance, uh, and, and LPA can match uh, its performance. Uh, so Megatron is, is this red bar and LPA is this green, uh, blue bar. And if we, and LPA, because LPA combines inter-operative parallelism and intra-operative parallelism, if we only use one of them, we cannot uh, maintain a good scaling uh, in, when, they are, uh, when we scale across to many GPUs. And for MOE, uh, because Megatron RM is a specialized system, so we cannot use Megatron RM to train MOE. Uh, the currently best available GPU implementation, implementation of MOE is provided by DeepSpeed. Uh, DeepSpeed also uh, implements a specialized uh, intra-OP parallelism strategy for MOE, uh, but that strategy is not compatible with pipeline with its pipeline parallelism engine, so basically uh, the deep speed here is uh, on, it can only use in char operator parallelism. So when we want to scale to multiple nodes with more GPUs, uh, due to the slow connection between nodes, uh, the deep speed cannot scale, cannot achieve a good performance when we scale across to multiple nodes. Well, well, sorry, what, what is linear scaling here? Sorry to explain that already. Uh, linear scaling, uh, so we will measure the uh, achieve the uh, tera flops per second per GPU. So, or like the device compute utilization per GPU. So linear scaling just means if we scale to more GPUs, like all GPUs are still heavily utilized. But if we, we if we cannot achieve linear scaling, which means we spend too, which means like our oh. our system is is communication bound, we spend yeah. too much time on communication. I see, I see. Okay. Yeah, and on GPT three, because when we increase the model size, we also increase the arithmetic intensity, so the computation is faster, so we can achieve uh, super linear scaling. I see. Okay, so so above outside of the box means not means uh, computation bound. Under the box means communication bound. Yeah, yeah, that... exactly, exactly. Okay. Can we assume that the communication between nodes is uniform in your environment? Um, I'm not sure where you evaluate on an ADAPS cluster, but they are placed like in the same uh, right. placement group. Okay. Uh, you, because I, I have seen some work on MOE that they optimize the layout in data centers, but it seems not the case in Alpha. Yeah, maybe 
maybe because our like the number of nodes is still very small. We will only allocate eight nodes. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, I I believe so. Yeah. And in pipeline parallel, we only do point to point communication. So, uh, they don't communicate to each other, but they only communicate to it. One one node only communicated to its neighborhood. Okay, and uh, similarly for wide ResNet, wide ResNet is a heterogeneous model because we because in convolution neural network, um, the activation the size of the size of activation is becoming slower, and the size of weight is becoming larger, along with when we uh. For different layers, uh, like the weights are different, so it's very hard to design a manual st strategy for wide rest net. So there is no manually designed strategy available. Um, but Alpha can still generalize to this kind of models and achieve a uh, uh, decent scaling performance. Okay. Um, I think that's all. And the compilation time uh, is acceptable um, for as a reference point, generating a plan for this largest GPT-3 model on 64 GPUs takes less than half an hour. So this is uh, negligible compared to the actual training time, which can take several weeks. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Yeah. So just, oh, sorry, sorry. I'll let you finish the summary slide. Okay, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, let me finish the summary and uh, you can ask questions. So we present LPA, a new system designed for automated distributed training. And LPA construct a two level hierarchical search space and solves each level optimally. LPA can match or outperform specialized systems and generalize to new models. Okay, I'm happy to take any questions. First, thanks for that, that awesome talk. Thank you, this work is really cool. Um, I wanna, just because I'm super unfamiliar, especially with distributed uh, training, how is this done? Okay, so I assume most people who are focused on this are in industry. Most people in, interested in chaining giant models or many of them are in the industry. Um, how, is this, how is this done? Otherwise, are there um, automated systems like what I assume Megatron LM um, is for for these big models to automate the distribution of them, or do people just like hand? Do they just do it by hand? Yeah. So for Megatron LM, uh, people just do it by hand. So people first look at the transformer model and design a parallelization strategy, and then write like manually fuse the kernel. Uh, for for all, all oh, the oh, operators okay. so, on transformer, so Megatron LM is did it it did it already have presets for each of these numbers of GPUs? It already had like manually designed distribution strategies for each of these numbers of GPUs. Is that oh no no like we have to do great search and find the best configuration for this baseline. Okay. Yeah, we okay. will do great search. Uh, Okay. Megatron ARM is specific for the transformer model for language model. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, Megatron ARM also has a search space, uh, but it's very limited. It only exposed like three integer parameters. So we will do great search for these three integer parameters. I see. And, okay. and report the best results we get. But otherwise, how, how, in your understanding, how do other people currently do this? Yes, yeah, they I mean, use. It seems like a big they selling use, point of your, of Alpha is like you basically go from zero to, you know, it, it's an infinite amount of performance increase when you enable somebody to do something that they couldn't do before. So, like, what were they doing before? Um, they use Megatron LM. If they want but to. Wait, is that it's only in the case of GPT three though, right? Yeah. So for other so for other large models, what would they do? Um, because currently all the large models are similar to GPT three, and for oh. ML, for maybe because of lack of system support, they cannot try uh, other variants. Maybe because transformer is, uh -huh. is too strong. Um, and 
a slightly different model is MOE. And at, at Google, um, they build, so at Google, so for MOE, we also have to utilize, use, use a different implementation. So we have to use a different implementation for training MOE. But by using LPA, you can arbitrarily design your model and LPA can automatically generate the best plan for your cluster. I see. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, you mentioned tofu. I believe tofu is another system that combines both uh, compilation level design runtime design because they have a DSL, DSL for tensor expressions. We, this is because they don't have JXPR. <laughs> so I I wonder is the major difference between Alpa and tofu is that you you explore the two level things such as uh internal communication and, and intranode communication. Is that right? Yes, there are, there are a lot of difference between LPA and TOEFL. Um, the most important, the most uh, important difference is, is Intel OP pass because, because in TOEFL, they, they only consider intra operator parallelism. In TOEFL, uh, it, it does consider pipeline parallelism. Yeah. So, and pipeline parallelism is required to scale to multiple nodes when, when the interconnect between nodes are slow. So that's the most uh, important oh, okay. difference. So it's because TOF, pipeline parallelism is missing TOEFL. Yeah, it's missing TOEFL. Cool. And then like there are also some minor difference, for example, in the intra-OP pass, which generalizes the uh, solution in TOEFL. Okay. okay. You can 